Thank you, Melissa. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church, and welcome back to many of our students who have returned from their long break. I probably had a long one, too, back in my day, but I don't remember it being that long. We are studying the name Jesus in uh, this month of January, five Sundays, five letters in the name Jesus in English, and today we arrive at the last letter, the end of the month, the letter S, and we see this prominently displayed in our Beatitudes today. Uh, my favorite Beatitude, Matthew 5, verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That's the word, okay, everybody's... They shall be satisfied. Yeah, well, you'll read it again twice later on. So that is our focus, and we will be also satisfied in the offering um, of Holy Communion today as we come to it and receive Christ and his body and blood in, with, and under the elements of bread and wine for the forgiveness of sins. Please take a moment to read the communion statement in the bulletin uh, as we prepare to receive Christ's supper to our soul's health. The opening hymn is hymn number 395, O Morning Star, How Fair and Bright. We sing verses 1 through 3. Please rise. Today we follow Divine Service Setting 4. It is on page 203 in your hymnal. It's also printed in your bulletin. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. 
before our general confession, let us take a moment and silently confess those sins that weigh on our heart today. We follow the confession. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of the altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, and seek his grace for the sake of Christ Jesus, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God has had mercy on us and sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place, and for his sake, he forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today our psalm is a psalm of David, Psalm 15. We read it responsively. It's on page 3 in your bulletin. Lord, who may reside in your tent? Who may settle on your holy hill? One who walks with integrity, practices righteousness, and speaks truth in his heart. A despicable person is despised in his eyes, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He takes on oath to his own detriment and does not change. One who does these things will never be shaken. Lord be with you. We go to our Lord in prayer, the collect on page four.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you that you have saved us and given us the ultimate satisfaction of your righteousness. As we walk with you by the gift of faith, may we daily discover that our soul is satisfied by doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with you. Protect us from seeking satisfaction beyond our faith in you. And may we receive with gratitude all the gifts and burdens in life, knowing that in your daily presence, as we walk by faith, we discover gifts to us become opportunities for kindness to others. And burdens become blessings which satisfy our soul as we carry them with you in life. In the name of Jesus, our satisfaction, we pray. Amen. May be seated for our first two readings. The Old Testament reading for this morning is Micah 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord has an indictment against his people and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. And what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Shall I give my first, uh, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Today's Episcopal reading is from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 31. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discreetment of the discerning. I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since is the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. 
But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of our Lord. And we rise for the verse of the day and our gospel. In your bulletin on page 4 in the middle, you'll see today's verse from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 6, and we read the verse together. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Holy Gospel for the fourth Sunday after the celebration of Epiphany is recorded in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, o Lord. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And opening his mouth, he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise you, Lord we gather our hearts together and profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. It's on page five in your bulletin. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the light of the world to come. Amen. Our sermon hymn today is hymn 411, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. You may be seated.
Justification. Epiphany. Servanthood. Unity. And satisfaction. All of these to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. During the month of January, which actually began in the Christmas season and has extended into the Epiphany season, we have been talking about Jesus. It began in the circumcision and naming of Christ at the beginning of the month, and we've continued to follow that name throughout those different themes. Justification, we stand before God innocent and approved in Christ. Jesus is our Epiphany. God opens up our eyes and gives us the light of the world, that Jesus is the God-man, the shepherd lamb, the just and the justifier, the judge of all the earth, and a friend of sinners. What an epiphany that is. And that Jesus is our servant. He looks at his disciples after washing their feet and says, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your teacher and Lord, wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Servanthood is not just our Savior's territory. And Jesus unites. Of course, he signifies this in the incarnation. He is God bringing man together literally in himself. And he does so on the cross and in the empty tomb. And this unity with God then flows through us into our friends, and into our love for our enemies. We love our enemies and we hold our friends accountable with the truth and grace. And now we have arrived today at Jesus satisfies. He satisfies with all of those blessings I just named. The justification, the epiphany, being a servant, and being united. All of that satisfies us and it does so as Christ changes our identity. Ultimately, we learn from the Beatitudes that Jesus' righteousness satisfies. Let's once again read the verse for the day in your bulletin on page 4. You'll see it there, Matthew 5, verse 6. <clears throat> and we read it together. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be satisfied. This is my favorite beatitude. Let me tell you why. I think it's the most important. It describes our identity in Christ. And after God has conceived in us this new identity, it starts to shape our life as we grow in Christ, and it makes us want to do the things that God does because we are in Christ. We are right with him. He is our righteousness. It's also a transition beatitude. You'll notice the change before and after as we start to be full of Christ and live our life differently. It is moving from getting to giving. And it's also somewhat circular in reasoning. For me, the most satisfying of all of the beatitudes I'm hungry and thirsty for the righteousness that Jesus gives me. I want to be declared right in his eyes. And having had that satisfaction, having had God himself say, I am your righteousness, trust me, it changes the way I look at things. And start to give my life away as Christ gave his life away. So let's take a look at the Beatitudes before we get into this specific Beatitude. Many of you have heard me say that I think there's a transition here between needing and then realizing that you want what you need, and then getting what you both need and want, and then finally giving what you have received. We see that in the Beatitudes. It is a progression. These are the words that Jesus begins his public ministry with, the most epic sermon ever given, the Sermon on the Mount. They're called the Beatitudes. So we get the word Beatitude from the Latin Vulgate. I don't know Latin, but it takes the first word in Greek, which I know a little bit about. It's one word, but it really translates into two words, blessed are. So the word Beatitude 
is also about being, and I think it is about attitude. It is our identity and it is our attitude. And of course, the attitude would also carry out into the behavior. Notice that being comes first. For Lutherans, that's important. We get our righteousness from Christ. So as we look at this particular sermon, we see that Matthew is describing it in a very parallel way to Moses going up on the mountain in Mount Sinai in Exodus chapters 19 and 20. You may remember the scenario. Everyone else has to stay down below the mountain, don't even go near it, put a border around it, have guards up, so to speak. And only Moses gets to go up on the mountain with God. But this is the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus invites his disciples up, which include, of course, the 12, and then thousands of others up on the mount. That's a symbol. Things have changed. The law has come, and now the gospel has come in Christ, and Christ wants us to get close to him, and he wants to get close to us. And so everybody's invited up on the mountain, and Matthew emphasizes what these people are going to hear. And opening his mouth, he began to speak. The word of God, just like it was back in Sinai, except now it's blessedness, not the law so much. As we look at this, we are hearing the word made flesh speak to the hordes and now through the inspiration of the New Testament speak to you and us today and all who read it. The first Beatitudes are a little bit surprising. You are blessed if you are poor, if you are sad, if you are lowly, if you are hungry, if you are thirsty. I think if we try to summarize those early Beatitudes, you could say that Jesus is trying to magnify the miserable. He wants people to be happy with their humility. And you can make a strong argument that Jesus is doing that precisely. Because there's a lot of people who don't know what they need. They're not happy in those circumstances. And yes, you can take the word blessed and just as equally translated happy. He wants them to recognize that they have needs. That they do have a spiritual poverty that needs the riches of God to fill their bank account of blessedness. They need to weep over that condition. They need to mourn. They need to repent, be humble, be meek. And they need the greatest of all blessings. They need the righteousness of God to fill their hearts. They hunger for that. That's a blessing. So we're blessed if we know that we have these needs. Spirits do need to be enriched. People who have the greatest grief, which is really dealing with death, either the death of their spirit and soul, which all people are born into that condition, or the ultimate death at the end of time, as we go to either hell or are raised to heaven, and all of us have that intermediary death, the one that we die physically, that's mourning. Jesus wants to get over that by living. And that's part of this beatitude today. Righteousness. I don't know if you were listening carefully to the end of our epistle today, but these are the words of St. Paul. He is the source of your life. In Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He is your righteousness. You get that, and then he is your life. He saves you and then calls you out of darkness into light. So in Christ, we get all of those things. And St. Paul, who really helps us see what God has given us in this righteousness, this gift of faith, even when we were dead in our transgressions, that's that first death into which we were born, he made us alive together with Christ. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. St. Paul is talking about the present tense. This gift of righteousness now places us next to Jesus. And from this heavenly perspective, we are validated by God himself who says, you are right. I made you that way in Christ. So St. Paul says Jesus is our righteousness. The Old Testament says God is our righteousness. We got to get that and we get connected to God when he comes down and shares that blessing with us. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You know, Micah really says that at the end of his verse, the final verse that you probably know by heart. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. You see, that's faith. Walking humbly with your God. That is walking in the symbiosis, that life exchange. Faith gives us his righteousness, And then connected to our head, we start living that way. We start doing the things Jesus wants us to do, and we find it satisfying. In the Old Testament, there are some clues to this tremendous transition. In our reading today, you may have picked up on the word indictment. Indictment is a legal term. It was a legal term the way the Hebrews used it. It's a legal term the way we use it. And God says he has an indictment against his people. His people did not know that they needed God's righteousness. They thought they had it by proximity. Hanging around Jesus doesn't necessarily give you his righteousness. And then they started to have the idea that, well, you know, he does ask us to make sacrifices, so maybe that's the way we get his righteousness. And so you heard God go into this sort of hyperbolic ecstasy where he says, shall I bring burnt offerings? Shall I bring calves? Shall I bring thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of oil? No. That's not how we get God's righteousness. We get it by simply trusting him. He is our righteousness. I'm going to walk with you in this life. And you're going to be my satisfaction. Because you are my satisfaction. People are oftentimes aware that they're not satisfied, but they don't really know why. There is this sort of itch of unsatisfaction, and they don't know where to scratch. So I'm a child of the 60s and 70s, and I grew up with the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. Some of you know the song Satisfaction. It came out in 1965. I can't get no satisfaction is what Mick Jagger sang famously or infamously. I can't get no girly action. Another one of the lyrics in there. The Rolling Stones have got nothing on the Israelites. So in this little verse that you and I read over, and I had to actually kind of go back to my notes and remember what this was all about. And when God says, He says, oh, my people, remember what happened between Shittim and Gilgal. Those three little words, Shittim and Gilgal, tell an epic story. Shittim was on the east side, outside the promised land of Israel, and then there was the Jordan River, and then there was Gilgal on the other side. Let's read the book of Numbers, which is not nearly as boring as the title sounds. You get to this chapter which is also alluded in the book of of, um, Micah in in verses uh, 5 and 6, where it tells the story of Balaam. So Balaam was a prophet who was well-known throughout the entire Middle East, and God met him and said, you know, you got to say exactly what I say, and you can't tell him anything different. So finally, after hearing out of the mouth of a donkey, he thought he probably should do what God said, and he did do it. But he was paid good money by a foreign king who said, you better curse these people. And Balaam thought about it. Well, I can have the best of both worlds. I can say what God says I have to say, but I can lead them into sin to act like the Midianites and their false gods. And so that's what he did. They got their girly action. They started to commit adultery across the border with the Midianites. Hey, it was a big party. Probably better than any that the Rolling Stones had in that negative sense. And it ended in great destruction, tragedy. And that happened on the east side. It's Shatim. And that happened on the border. And then they spent more and more years wandering because they thought that was where their satisfaction was going to be. But finally, after 40 years of purging, when that old generation died out, there was a new generation. 
And they were going to cross over the Jordan River, which, like the Red Sea crossing, was another miracle. And the Ark of God, which, by the way, represents Jesus, was placed in the River Jordan, and the River Jordan stopped up, and the waters flowed up to the north, and nothing went down south to the Dead Sea, and they crossed across the Jordan River. And all those young men who were born either in the wilderness journey or who were not adults were circumcised at Gilgal on the west side. So they crossed the Red Sea, entered the Promised Land. They lost something, which you do in circumcision, and they also got something. I'm fascinated to know that the word Gilgal, which is the name that means rolling, also means stone, rolling stones, pun intended. But it's related to another rolling, Golgotha. That's where God really rolled away our approach and everything took on a new view. He is our righteousness, and you see it there up on the cross. I will take away your sin, I will pay your bill, and so now you get my righteousness when you trust me. Matthew 5 is so critical because it's the righteousness of Jesus that satisfies. Ironically, Mick Jagger, who wrote that song, co-authored it with one of the other band members, became addicted to sex and in a very public way entered into treatment for that. So the very thing that he thought would give him satisfaction ended up becoming slavery. If he would have only discovered that Jesus is his righteousness, and what it means to have satisfaction in doing the things that Jesus does. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. I don't really know what's coming around the corner, but if I'm with Christ, I'm ready for it. Living this life of satisfaction, you're going to be merciful, you're going to be pure in heart, you're going to be a peacemaker. All things that take action. Things that you go out and you do. You are full of mercy. You bring purity to life. And you are a peacemaker, which means bringing Jesus to people. This is a satisfying way to live. It's exciting to sit down next to somebody and tell them about Jesus, who is our righteousness, who is our satisfaction. And I can tell someone unequivocally, I know I am going to heaven not by what I have done, but by what he did for me. And I find that supremely satisfying. The second time the word satisfaction appears in my English Bible is when Abraham dies. He dies satisfied. It says that. Genesis 25. Why? Because he finally learned to trust God fully. And his life was satisfied. No matter what we face, if you have God and you trust God, and you trust God in Christ, you are right in him, and you know where you're going. You are satisfied. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, stand guard over our hearts and minds to keep us satisfied in our Savior Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise and we sing the offertory hymn, hymn number 395, verses 4, 5, and 6.
together your prayers and your offerings. You may be seated. Lord Jesus Christ, you are our righteousness. Robed in that righteousness by the gift of faith in the waters of baptism, we stand before you innocent. We look like you. Now help us, Lord, to grow up inside of those robes of righteousness and walk like you, walking with you, doing justice, loving kindness, walking humbly with you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Jason Cooper has a prayer for his friends who are sick. Lauren is, uh, has a prayer of praise. Her, brother's, her friend's brother has been healed, and he will soon be going back to school. Um, they had a bad hockey accident a few weeks ago. Um, prayer of praise for prophecies that come true and faith to believe them. A prayer for Noah Schultz. I got this call yesterday from Marty, and this is her great-grandson who's had some serious health issues, and he's now back in the hospital, and I don't know his status today, but yesterday they took him with a very high fever, um, and so we're praying for young Noah. Um, a prayer from Christy, encouragement and healing for Aunt Tia, who began radiation this week for cancer. Um, prayer for Jim Morby for the Amish community as they mourn a, mother, uh, a mother's grandmother who died in an auto accident. A mother and grandmother. All right. Let's rise for these prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks when we are restored in our physical health. Um, we are thankful for a friend of Lauren's who has been restored after a bad accident in hockey. We pray that he would see your hand in that healing. We also are praying for those who are still sick, friends of Jason. We ask, Lord, that you would be merciful and touch their bodies with healing. We pray, Lord, for young Noah. We don't know his circumstance today, but we pray that you would give wisdom to those who care for him and knowledge and that Noah would be strengthened, help his family not to be anxious, but to call upon your name and trust you completely. We ask, Lord, that you would be with Aunt Tia, Christie's Aunt Tia, who began radiation this week. 
May she have courage and strength to know that she can do all things through Christ who gives her that. We thank you, Lord, for your word and those prophecies that come true, uh, magnificent. We pray that we would see them and believe them. We ask, Lord, that you would bless the um, folks who grieve for the mother and grandmother who died in an auto accident in the Amish community this week. Give them consolation and strength. Uh, be with Jim and all those who are friends in that community, that they would have the right words and compassion at the right time. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We prepare for communion with a preface on page 5 in your bulletin. May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all of creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption that you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. <clears throat> in the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had supped and given thanks, he gave it to them and he said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. May the peace of the Lord be with you always.
We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Uh, I don't know if there are any announcements today before we leave the sort of board. Nada. Oh, I see one. Lisa, hi. Hi. Bible study starts back up for college students Monday. So tomorrow, uh, 6 o'clock, we'll be back in the Lord's Prayer. Tuesday, we're back in the Lord's Prayer. Thanks to the Coopers for leading that study. Okay, if there are no other announcements, thank you for worshiping today. Remember the name of Jesus and that he is your righteousness and be satisfied. In that, go with God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor, giving you his peace. Amen. Amen.